On the 11th of February 2010, the quiet city of Greensburg, Pennsylvania was blanketed with snow. And on that frigid morning, a truck driver made his way to his cab, which was parked outside a middle school. Little did he know he was about to make a chilling discovery. One that would open up a harrowing case and shake this small community to its core. Hello and welcome to the little shop of crime, curators and purveyors of all things macabre and mysterious. Now, Carol Bundy and Doug Clark, Myra Hindley and Ian Brady, Fred and Rose West. Whenever I see couples who kill together, I can't help but wonder if monsters like that are somehow attracted to one another, or if one of them has an overwhelming dark influence over the other. And today's case is unlike any other I've ever read about, because it involves a prolonged and atrocious attack carried out by no fewer than six individuals. You probably saw the warning card at the beginning of this episode, but I do have to make you aware that it does contain some really upsetting themes involving torture, and it definitely isn't for everyone. So if you're of a more sensitive disposition, maybe give this one a miss. But before we get into it, some quick shopkeeping. My name is Steve, and I offer interesting true crime cases each week, usually solved, but occasionally mysterious. And today's case was recommended by a viewer. If you have any case suggestions you might like me to cover, feel free to drop them in the comments below. Okay, let's investigate. This is the Greensburg Six, the harrowing case of Jennifer Doherty. Today we take our first trip together to the Keystone State, Pennsylvania, and to the city of Greensburg. Located 30 miles southeast of Pittsburgh, Greensburg is a small city with a population of fewer than 15,000 people. It smacks of small town America, the type of place with a friendly, tight-knit community where not an awful lot happens. In fact, this quaint and quiet little city is regularly voted as one of the best places to retire in the whole of Pennsylvania. And just 10 miles south of Greensburg is Mount Pleasant, which in 2010 was home to 30-year-old Jennifer Doherty. Jennifer was sweet-natured, easygoing and fun, someone who loved to dance and sing and live life to the fullest, making friends easily. But she also had undiagnosed learning and developmental difficulties, which limited her mental capacity to that of a child. Because of this, she struggled with certain social cues and was inherently trusting, believing in the goodness of people around her. Naturally, this made her a little naive. Despite her mental difficulties, her family were keen to allow her to live a fruitful adult life, and Jennifer would travel alone by bus from Mount Pleasant to nearby Greensburg to attend various appointments. They even encouraged her to find a home of her own so she could be more independent, something which her mother Denise would later admit to regretting. Despite her uplifting nature, Jennifer was frequently bullied throughout school and would confess that she just wished to be what she described as a normal girl. She had all the usual aspirations, to live alone, work, marry and have children of her own. And at age 30 she was well on her way to achieving her dream. She was training to become a mechanic and she'd been preparing to move into her own place. The last message she ever posted to her MySpace and Twitter followers was This is my time to make a new start for myself and making new friends and not being afraid of anything. It was during one of her trips alone to Greensburg that Jennifer made a group of new friends at the West Place Clubhouse, a community centre which helps people with mental health issues. She had one close friend in particular, Angela Marinucci. Angela was just 17, and as a result of colliding with a truck in 2008 when she was 15, she'd suffered a pretty severe head injury, which dramatically altered her behaviour and cognitive abilities. She and Jennifer became very close friends and would regularly chat for hours on the phone. And Angela was one of six new friends Jennifer had come to meet in Greensburg. 23-year-old Ricky Smearns was Angela's boyfriend. Born to drug-addicted parents, Ricky had spent his youth in and out of foster homes, suffering a litany of abuse and neglect. 
He'd experimented with alcohol, marijuana, cocaine and heroin by the time he was six years old. He was diagnosed with PTSD when he was eight, and by the time he was ten years old, when he eventually settled with the Smyrns family, he had undergone 103 therapy sessions. He was later diagnosed as having seven different personalities and 15 psychiatric issues. Following a life of crime, including burglary and indecent assault, he spent some time in prison, which is where he met Melvin Knight. 20-year-old Melvin was also born to a drug-addicted father, who was imprisoned for much of Melvin's early life. At the age of five, he fell from a moving vehicle onto his head, which resulted in lifelong learning and social difficulties. Melvin had met his girlfriend, 20-year-old Amber Maidinger, at a homeless shelter in Washington in January 2010. She fell pregnant to him soon after, and so they accepted an offer to move in with Ricky in his apartment in Greensburg. The four began visiting the community centre together, where they also befriended 36-year-old Robert Masters and 26-year-old Peggy Miller, and of course, Jennifer. One day in February, Angela invited Jennifer to a sleepover at Peggy's home in Greensburg. Naturally, Jennifer eagerly jumped at the chance of spending time with her new best friend. Plus, she had an appointment in the city the following morning, so it was a convenient opportunity. On the morning of the trip, she scrawled a note onto the back of an envelope for her mother, which read, Mum, I hope you have a good day at work and I love you very much. I will talk to you sometime later. Love, Jennifer. Her stepfather Bobby dropped her at the bus station in Mount Pleasant and she kissed him on the cheek and said goodbye, and Jennifer excitedly made her way to the sleepover. But it was a trap. Allegedly, Angela had overheard her boyfriend Ricky speaking with Jennifer on the phone. She heard him say that he loved her and wanted to marry her. Angela was enraged at the prospect of this love triangle, and so she hatched a plot to humiliate Jennifer, a plot that would escalate into the most horrific ordeal. Jennifer arrived for the sleepover at what she thought was Peggy's place to find there were, in fact, six people there. The six people she had unwittingly grown to consider as her friends. And as soon as she entered what was actually Ricky's apartment, things quickly took a disturbing turn. Angela accused Jennifer of sleeping with her man and had somehow come to the conclusion that she was pregnant with his baby. And so she began inciting the others to take it in turns to kick her in the stomach. And this would only be the beginning of an escalating series of assaults on the vulnerable young woman. The group went through her purse and stole money, gift cards and her cell phone. They then poured liquids into her bag and began to hit her over the head with filled soda bottles. They used these scissors to cut all of her hair off, before they painted her face with nail polish. The gang then stripped her naked and poured water and oatmeal over her head and rubbed spices into her eyes. Jennifer screamed that her eyes were burning and pleaded with them to stop. She asked what she'd done to deserve all of this. But Ricky Smearns just laughed and told her she needed a shower because she smelled so bad, and the assaults continued. They forced her to drink this entire bottle of cooking oil, before they wrapped her in fairy lights and demanded she pose as a Christmas tree. 36 hours the horrific ordeal lasted. 36 hours that were seemingly driven by the barbaric desire to humiliate Jennifer as inhumanely as possible. And the six would periodically lock her inside a dark wardrobe while they held sick meetings about what they could do with her next. During the brutal assault, neighbours heard body slamming and screaming, but authorities were never called. At one point, Melvin Knight took Jennifer into a bedroom where he gagged her with a sock and indecently assaulted her. Peggy Miller and Robert Masters apparently took no part in Jennifer's torture, but they were part of the meetings. Not only that, but at one point they were left alone with her while the four others left for a couple of hours. During this time, Jennifer begged and pleaded with them to let her go, but they didn't. Jennifer very nearly escaped at one point. She saw an opportunity when they turned their backs and made a run for the door, but she was stopped moments before she could get out. Upon their return, Peggy and Robert told the others of her attempted escape, and they decided her behaviour was worthy of further punishment. Jennifer was forced to drink detergent, bleach and nail polish. She was fed cigarette ash, chilli powder and various medications. 
she was also forced to consume urine and feces. She was hit repeatedly with a vacuum cleaner hose and Amber and Angela took turns to violently beat her with this crutch and with this metal towel rack. After a harrowing 36 hours of abhorrent torture, the six sat down for one final meeting to decide the fate of Jennifer. Given how the torment had escalated, her six captors feared the legal consequences of what they'd already done to her. And all six of the vulnerable young Jennifer's so-called friends, the people she loved and trusted, voted for her to die. They forced her to write this suicide note, which reads... I haven't been very happy for a while, and I also feel that everyone will be better off without me on the earth. I will always love my mum and stepdad no matter what, and I will always love the rest of my family also. My nieces and nephews would be lucky to have a better aunt than me. I am done with life. Goodbye, Jennifer. The note was stuffed inside Jennifer's back pocket in the hope that when she was eventually found it would be assumed that she'd ended her own life. Peggy Miller tied Jennifer up with fairy lights once again, and Melvin Knight and Ricky Smearns then marched her to the bathroom where they fed her sleeping pills. Ricky then went to the kitchen and returned with this steak knife, which he passed to Melvin. He hesitated and then asked Jennifer if she was ready to die. He then plunged the knife into Jennifer's chest and throat, puncturing a lung in the process. He and Ricky passed the knife back and forth, stabbing her a further 18 times. They then left her to bleed to death in the bathroom. The group later went to check on Jennifer, expecting to find her dead, but she was still breathing, and Melvin shouted, This bitch ain't dead, despite all of the injuries she sustained throughout her torturous ordeal and suffering 20 stab wounds, Jennifer was fighting to live. And so Ricky and Melvin slit both of her wrists, wrapped the Christmas lights around her neck, and together they pulled on each end and strangled her to death. The two men wrapped Jennifer's lifeless body in a garbage bag before dumping her inside a trash can in the parking lot of Greensburg Middle School. A witness later came forward to say they'd seen two men dragging the trash can through the snow, where they pushed it underneath a truck. Later that morning, on the 11th of February 2010, the truck driver arrived at his truck and made the awful discovery. One of the most tragic aspects of this case is that Jennifer's own mother had to identify her body and witness all of the horrific injuries that had been inflicted upon her. Forensic pathologist Cyril H. Wecht, who had conducted and reviewed thousands of autopsies of homicide victims, stated, This is one of the most horrific cases I've ever seen. You have one young, defenceless woman, six people who are keeping her captive and doing all of these things, knowing she is mentally challenged. Put it all together, it's bizarre. It is extreme barbarism. And it didn't take long for the group that would later be named as the Greensburg Six to be taken in for questioning. Remember the note that Jennifer had left for her mother the previous morning, while she'd also crucially left Angela's contact details on it too. Not only that, but her sister had tried to call her a number of times that day, only to discover her voicemail greeting had been changed to say, you've reached the phone of Melvin and Amber. Yeah, this hearing is still going on. It has been going on for about two hours now. You talk about graphic, you talk about disturbing. I've been a reporter now for almost 20 years. I've seen and I've heard an awful lot of things, but to hear somebody describe in detail how he and his friends tortured a woman and then killed her, honestly, it's the most disturbing thing I've ever heard. None of the six defendants said a word as they arrived at court this morning, but inside the courtroom, the taped statement of suspect Melvin Knight did plenty of talking. According to detectives, they interviewed Knight just hours after they had discovered the body of 30-year-old Jennifer Doherty. Knight describes in great detail how they tortured Doherty for 36 hours before they killed her. According to the statement, it started when Doherty made a pass at defendant Ricky Smearns. Smearns' girlfriend, Angie Marinucci, got angry and started beating Doherty. The others joined in, including Knight and Amber Meidinger. All six were charged with Jennifer's murder, and when the trial began nine months later, prosecutors were seeking the death penalty for Ricky Smearns, Melvin Knight, and Amber Meidinger. 
Angela Marinucci was ineligible given she was only 17 at the time of the crimes. However, Amber reached a plea bargain along with Robert Masters, and both agreed to testify against the others for a lesser sentence. In court, they gave detailed and gruesome testimony about the attacks, which they said were initially intended to embarrass Jennifer, to humiliate her and make her feel belittled. They alleged that it was Angela who'd lured her to the apartment where Ricky led the vicious attacks. Following news reports on the crime, a cellmate and friend to Angela Marinucci testified that she was giddily jumping on her bed, excited to be on the news. Other fellow inmates testified that she'd confessed to having planned to kill Jennifer a number of days before the assaults began. Peggy Miller and Robert Masters were never accused of participating in any of the assaults or the murder. However, given that they'd participated in the meetings and agreed that she should die, along with the fact that they hadn't let Jennifer go when they had the opportunity, they were nonetheless charged with homicide. Their lawyers attempted to argue that they were scared of the other members and feared that they too could be killed. Jennifer's family responded to their statements and pleaded with the judge to give them harsh sentences for their role in the murder. All six members of the group pled guilty to murder. Angela Marinucci was found guilty of first-degree murder and given a mandatory life sentence without the possibility of parole. A later appeal had this sentence revoked and she was given life with a possibility of parole in 2070. Having managed to avoid the death penalty due to her testimony, Amber Meidinger was found guilty of third-degree murder, kidnapping and conspiracy. She was sentenced to 40 to 80 years in prison. During her incarceration, she gave birth to Melvin's baby, and the newborn was placed with a foster family. Peggy Miller was found guilty of third-degree murder and sentenced to 35 to 74 years. Robert Masters was found guilty of third-degree murder, conspiracy to commit murder, and conspiracy to commit kidnapping. Although he never shared information about his plea bargain, he was given a lesser sentence than Miller, 30 to 70 years in prison. Melvin Knight pled guilty to first and second degree murder, kidnapping and the conspiracy to commit murder and kidnapping. The jury deliberated for several hours before they voted for him to be put to death. He has since unsuccessfully appealed to have this sentence reduced. Ricky Smearns was given the same charges as Melvin Knight and he too was sentenced to death and has failed in later appeals. Both Melvin and Ricky remain on death row. Pennsylvania doesn't rush when it comes to capital punishment. Only three people have been executed since 1976, and nobody has since 1999. Outside of court, Bobby, Jennifer's stepfather, said, Closure is Jennifer coming back to us, and Jennifer won't come back, so there is no closure. During a 2012 conference, Pennsylvania State Senator Kim Ward unveiled a legislation named Jennifer's Law, which would make it illegal for a person to witness a violent crime and fail to report it to police. That was a tough one, guys. Really tough. It's one of the worst cases I've ever looked into. Jennifer's vulnerability and childlike perspective on the people around her and the people she trusted made it so much worse. There isn't really much else I could say, but my heart goes out to her loved ones. Thanks so much for stopping by with me here at the Little Shop of Crime. Hope to see you next week when I'll be back with a whole new case. See ya.